Hello everyone, and welcome to Introduction to R, Part 10, Reading and Writing Data. So in this lesson, we are going to learn various ways to read data into your R programming environment from different data sources. So up till now, we've basically been generating data within R, but usually in the real world, you're going to get your data from somewhere else, and it's not going to be something that you just generate within the programming environment itself. So to start out with, we're actually going to look into working with the directories and file paths in R. When you're loading data, you generally want the data to be in whatever directory you're currently working in, or at least you'll need to know the file path to the data you're loading. So the, this first function here we're going to look at, git wd, just shows you the current directory that you're working in. Um, since we're in the Kaggle kernel environment, this will actually be something on Kaggle's cloud. So let's see what that is. You can see in our Kaggle cloud environment, there's something called the Kaggle slash working directory. So that is what we're currently in. Now you can change your file path in R by using the set WD function or set working directory. So here we are setting the working directory to just the Kaggle folder, so we're basically going up a level and we're not going to be in the working directory anymore. So we'll do that and then we'll check the working directory again to confirm that we've changed the directory successfully. So now we're just in the Kaggle folder and there's presumably other folders within that. You can create a new file path with the file.path function. So what that does is it takes a comma separated sequence of character strings that are the different folders to the file path you want. So in this case, we're making a new path. We're saving it as file.path, starting with Kaggle and then comma working. So this is constructing a path back to that Kaggle working directory that we started with. We're setting it back to this my path and then we'll check it again to make sure that we are actually back in the working directory again. So it says we are back in Kaggle working. You can list all the files in a given directory using the list.files function. Here we're calling list.files on dot dot slash input. What the dot dot does is it goes up a level in the folder hierarchy. So we're currently in Kaggle slash working. The dot dot is throwing us back into the Kaggle folder. And then within that, we're going to the input folder. So in Kaggle, there is both an input folder, which is where the input data is, and there's a working folder, which is what we're currently in. But this is checking the files we have available in the input folder. So when we run that, we sh it shows that we have a draft 2015 file and a Titanic file. So both of these are data files that uh, we can have access to in our Kaggle environment here. And just to look a little more into the files available, we can check what's in input and the, within the Titanic folder. So input has draft 2015 and Titanic. Within Titanic, we see three different data files, a submission, a test set, and a train set. So now on to reading data. You'll often get data in the form of what's known as a CSV or comma separated values file, or a TSV, which is a tab separated values file. All these are, are essentially tabular data structures where each comma is separated by a delimiter or separator character. In the case of comma separated values, it's a comma. In the case of tab separated values, it's a tab. And those are two of the most common data sources to have for flat files. So we'll learn how to load those in first. R has a built-in function called read.csv, which allows you to read in CSV files. So here we're going to read.csv in the titanic training csv file that we saw that was in that input folder earlier and we're just storing that in a variable called titanic and checking the head first few rows so we'll run that and see what the result is you can see we successfully loaded in some data here it looks like we have some passengers with different ages so is the gender the ticket fare various data about passengers aboard the titanic Now, if you wanted to load in a tab separated values file, you can actually use the same function, the read.csv function, to do that. 
but you need to add this extra argument here, sep equals slash t. Sep means what separator or delimiter the file has. So by default, read.csv will choose the separator being a comma, because that's what CSVs do. But if you add this slash t, which means a tab character, it will change that and allow you to read in um, tab separated value files. Let's try running this. As you can see in this case, the behavior is not exactly what we wanted because we were actually loading in a CSV, not a TSV. So instead of loading in each column, the function didn't know to separate it on commas. So every column was kind of concatenated together and we only have one super big column that's basically a c combination of everything. But if this was a TSV file, it would have read it in and gave us nice columns like the previous one. Now, another common data type that you'll encounter is Excel files. So there are various ways you could read Excel files into R, but you generally will need to load in a separate library or package to do those. So to read in Excel files, we're going to use the read Excel library. Um, this is available by default in the Kaggle kernel environment. So we're just going to load that. If you're working on a local install, you will have to install this first. I believe you can probably just download this directly from CRAN. So if you run install.packages and put this in as the package name, you should be able to install it. But now we've loaded it in. And after you've loaded it, you just use this function called read underscore Excel. And then you can pass in the file path that you want to read from. So this is the file to read. And then you put a comma and you specify the worksheet within the Excel file that you want to read. In this case, we're just reading the first worksheet. So we're putting in one here. We're going to save this in a variable called draft. It's just some data from the 2015 NBA draft. So I'll run it and look at the first 10 entries. And you can see it's showing us some top prospects from that draft season in the NFL and their uh, what different news outfits, sports news outfits, thought they would come in at in the draft. So a lot of data you'll want access to is actually going to be on the web. And there are various ways you can get data from the web. One is that if you're actually working from a local R install, you can copy data to the clipboard and read it in using a read.clipboard type function. But since we're in this Kaggle kernel environment, that's not going to work for us because what we're copied to our local machine clipboard is not going to be something we can access within this environment. But probably the simplest way to get web data most of the time is actually just to download the data to your machine in some form that's easy for R to digest. So usually you'll have an option with web data to say download something as a CSV or a TSV or an Excel file or something like that. And downloading that and then loading it into R from that file is probably the easiest way to go about doing it. So we're not going to go too much more into web data, but just know that Oftentimes, data on the web is something that you'll be working with. And if you're in Kaggle, you'll have direct access to data sets through the Kaggle environment. So you don't need to be worrying about downloading it onto your local machine because you just need to connect the data set to the project you're working on. And then you can load it in just from the directories like we did earlier with the Titanic data. So now that we learned how to read data into R, it'd be also be nice to learn how to write data we have in R back to a file. So one simple way of doing this is a built-in function called write.csv. So here we're doing write.csv. We're just going to pass in the draft data as the data we're writing. Second argument after this first comma is you put the name of the file you want to save it in. So here we're saving it in a file called draft 2015 saved.csv and this extra argument here after the second comma row.names equals false just means we are not going to store the row names as an extra column because generally all that does is make an extra column at the beginning that's just the number of rows and that's usually not something that's necessary so if we run that um, it won't produce any output because we're not making any output with this function, but it did write this to a file. 
There are several other R packages for reading and writing data that are worth going over just because the built-in ones do work and for smaller data sets, they, they're fine. But certain packages allow for reading and writing data much faster than base R functions. So if you're working with fairly large data sets, it can save a lot of time to use packages that have better functions for that. So one other reading function is in the read R library, and it's called read underscore CSV. So instead of read dot CSV, it's read underscore CSV. And it essentially does the same thing as read dot CSV. It's just a bit faster. And I believe it loads that it might load the data in in a special type of data frame called a tibble that is used in certain other R packages. But that's just not super important. The main important thing is that it's actually faster than read.csv. So I'll use that and just show that it produces more output when you run it, showing how characters and different variables were read in. But the end result is the exact same data table of Titanic data that we looked at before. And for the Titanic data, it doesn't really matter because it's a small data set. But if this was, this was a large data set, this would be significantly faster. Um, and then there is a third reading function in the library data.table, and that is called fread or fast read. So with that one, you just use fread and you use the file path here, same thing. And fread is very fast. So if you have a very large data set that you're trying to load in, fread is probably the way to go because it will generally just save time. And if you need to convert the data back to just a standard data frame after you load it in, you can do that just with the data.frame function. So even though this might be read in in a slightly different data frame format, it's easy to convert back into the base R one if you need to do that. So we'll just run that and show that again, we loaded in the data and it's the exact same thing as before, but this fread is a lot faster if you have a good amount of data. And just to show that these are reading data in in different formats, we'll run class on the original Titanic set, the fast one, and then the super fast one. You can see that the base R version just loads it in in a data frame. The read R version is a data frame, but it's also a special type of data frame called a table DF or tibble. And then the data.table version is a special type of data frame called the data.table, which is used in that package. So all these things count as data frames, but the ones that use these packages have some extra features that make them a bit different than your standard data frame. You don't really need to worry about those differences at this point, but just know that if you use those functions, the data is going to be in a bit of a different format than the standard data frame. So again, like I said, you can just convert the special data frames back into standard ones if you want to. So just use as.data.frame to do that. So if we run that on these special data frames and check the class again, both of them have just been converted back to standard data frames. And finally, the data.table package also has a fast data writing function called fwrite. So if you use that, you just call the function, you pass in the data, and you specify the file you want to write to. And fwrite can write data substantially faster than the standard write.csv. So if you happen to be wanting to dump a significant amount of data to disk in a file, you might want to consider using this instead of the normal read.csv function. But usually it's not a huge deal because you're probably not writing a huge amount of data to file. But it's good to know about this if you happen to need it run that and that should have created an output file for this kernel. So data comes in a lot of different formats, both online and in databases and other things. You might encounter JSON files, HTML, SAS, SPSS. There's all kinds of data files out there. So it's really not possible to cover 
every single potential type of data you might want to read in in one lesson. We just covered kind of the most common ones, but if you encounter a data source that has any amount of commonality, there's going to be an R package somewhere that you can load in that will let you access that data. <clears throat> because R is one of the most popular languages for working with data. So there are packages for loading in just about anything, but it might take a little bit of Googling to figure out what exactly you need if you do encounter a data source that you can't load easily just with a base function. So now that we've learned about all the basic R data types and data structures, and we know how to load data into R, we're going to start learning how to do programming in R in the next lesson, we'll focus on programming control flow. So see you then.